Gary Hart is the man to beat in 88. If we hold ourselves to those highest standards, then the voters cannot do otherwise. Senator, I want to ask you some questions about the woman at your townhouse. Can you tell us how you know her? You can't be serious. No one is staying in my home. There's no need for that. Uh, I, I am serious, sir. <laughs> oh, cinnamon, where are you gonna run to? The one thing I asked was that you don't embarrass me. We can't hide from this. The cameras go everywhere. It's up to us to hold these guys accountable. Just because some other paper used gossip as front page news, I mean, that doesn't mean we have it to. It does. It does now. He is a man with power, and that takes certain responsibility. We need to say something. It's nobody's business. None of it is. OK, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about how you get through today. This campaign is about the future, not rumors, not sleaze, and I care about the sanctity of this process, whether you do or do not. Go on, Gary. Say it. There's gonna be a story tomorrow about me. Hello. Just Excited, aren't you? Hello, Toronto! This is a very exciting night for us. I'm really freaking excited to be here tonight. What a great audience. I'm so, so excited to be here. It's such a great honor. And I'm so honored to be able to show my film to this august crowd. What's really fun is people who love film, and you are all that, and we're very proud and happy to be here with all of you. We should not be afraid to tell stories, because we are afraid that people will judge. Thank you for giving us the opportunity and a platform to be able to showcase our work as female filmmakers. This is for my parents who couldn't come, so thank you. I'm going to prove it to them. I did it! I've just realized what TIFF actually stands for. Toronto is... Fantastic. <laughs> this is the story of our city, and we're a very proud city, and I want the world to see it. Uh, yeah, I was listening to uh, the show uh, Radio Lab, and they had done an episode on Matt Bai's book about Gary Hart. And when I listened to it, I just couldn't imagine that there was a moment in our history when the presumed next president of the United States was in a dark alleyway in the middle of the night with three reporters, and no one knew what to do, because no one had been in that situation before. Uh, 
Sorry. I sometimes spit lightning bolts. It's just some fun. Uh, I did. Uh, Watch out. I'm, I'm the next Avenger. No, they, um, I did have much the same thought. Uh, it goes back a long way. I mean, I, I uh, met Gary Hart in, uh, when I was writing for the New York Times Magazine. He was a pretty new writer there in 2002. Uh, I wrote a piece which um, repeated, quite honestly, a lot of the sort of tropes and, and misperceptions about the scandal. I'm, I'm not proud of that. I wasn't proud of it at the time. Uh, it was a fine piece, but it, it didn't delve deeply enough. And I, I thought about it for years afterward. It kind of stayed with me. I thought uh, Hart had been incredibly impressive. I was watching, uh, as, as, as uh, Jay was from the other side, as a political operative, what it was to cover presidential campaigns in the modern uh, era and, and how the system was sort of broken. And I began to feel there was a connection uh, that needed to be explored. And I went back and did this book on Gary Hart uh, and, um, you know, to, and, and explored a lot of those themes. And that's what, uh, you know, Jason saw it very much the same way. And Jay and I had been working together, and the three of us uh, came together and, uh, and, and had this vision for, for what the movie could be. Um, what attracted you to it? This. Uh, mm. Jason Reitman was the first thing uh, I heard. The script is coming uh, that Jason is going to direct. And uh, as an actor, you read things with a certain framework when you get to page one. And my framework the entire time was, please love this, please love this, because <laughs> I'm a massive fan of Jason. So, so if this sucks, I don't want to have to say no? I was going to say yes anyway, basically. <laughs> uh, it just so happened I, I, I was on a gap year in 1987 when all this happened. I was turning 19 and probably drunk most of the year. I remember very little of it, if anything. <laughs> so I really, as an outsider, as an Aussie, uh, I, I took to the story very fresh and I found it very somehow relevant. And weirdly, sort of, uh, as someone who loves puzzles, there was a piece of the puzzle that I never knew about, but somehow made sense a little bit of what was happening today. Um, I'm also a, a journalism major, so I was That's very right. uh, interested in that. And so, story, Director, story, I'm in. Helen, it's hard to tell this story and watch the story without being completely connected to today. It's an impossible reality in a sense, because you're looking at it thinking, that sunk a front runner. And there was never even really an admission, but that sunk a front runner. I mean, talk about the lessons that politicians have learned since then about this, this Gary Hart ordeal. Oh, well, I'm, I'm not a politician, so I don't know what the lessons I, they might have learned, but I do know that one of the reasons we were so excited about this was because it was a way to engage with the questions that I think were uh, many questions we're asking ourselves about today without having the divisiveness of having to be talking about something that's happening right now and sort of having a bit of space to be able to look at it from, uh, from with some perspective and say, oh, it's really interesting that it's so different now, but what does this mean for how we think of men in power? What is does it mean for the women who work for with him? What does it mean for all of these different things? And being able to ask those questions and engage in those ideas in a way that felt more comfortable and more easy to have those conversations that still are very relevant to what we should be thinking about today. I mean, you were, you've were you worked with politicians. They've learned from this, right? They have. I mean, part of what drew me to this is I worked in politics for 15 years, and as Matt, and it really broke my heart. Um, I went into it with as much idealism as you could possibly have and left it with a lot of cynicism. As Matt started to tell me about his book when he was working on it, I just, he, he was like talking me through it and I just said, that is a fucking movie. Uh, and it was a movie that I, it was a movie that I wanted to be, wanted to be a part of because it was a way to, as Helen just said, it was a way to speak to what we were going through today. Although today when we started this was, was, was years ago. So this, a lot of people have thought like, oh, these guys must have woken up the day after, you know, November 10th. To, uh, 2016 and started this movie. We were into this movie years ago. We had a script that we, that was basically the one we, more or less the one we shot well before election day. Um, this was something that you know Matt saw coming and that for various reasons we felt we felt drawn to well before the world got into the much more messed up place that it is um, that it is today. You know, Jason, as a filmmaker, this is. You know, I've heard a lot of people talk about how this is a different film for you to make, um, but this is a different film for you to make as well. Mm -hmm. uh, did it feel that way? I, you know, it did. I mean, first of all, this is a movie about real people. And this is the first time I felt the responsibility as a storyteller, and I know you felt the same way, uh, that, oh, we're, we're dealing with real people's lives, people who are still alive today. Um, and there's something that's scary about that. Um, and this, I took a different tact stylistically to the film. Uh, the Frontrunner is a movie that is asking you constantly what is important and what is relevant. 
And we wanted to do that as filmmakers as well. So it's a film where you're looking at 12 different points of view. There are often two to three conversations happening on camera at once. And we shot it in this kind of 1970s style that is making you as a viewer constantly trying to figure out and make a decision about, all right, who do I want to follow? What is the important conversation? Because that, that's what really the whole film is about. You take these really, really important moments where, especially when, when Donna's talking and when the women in this film are talking, everything else around it stops. Yeah. So when I'm watching the film, especially when the men are going, there's a lot of noise, it's a lot of layers, but then when these characters, when Vera has her moment, like it stops, mm -hmm. and you're forced to fo focus on them and their story. Was that intentional? Uh, certainly, uh, look, this is, uh, The Front Runner is a movie that is also very interested in the emotional burden that is put on women during a scandal, whether it's Donna Rice, a young, <laughs> bright, uh, aspirational woman who had her life just stolen from her, it was just kind of ripped out of her hands, or whether you were the young, one young woman working at the Washington Post, or one young woman working on a campaign, and are forced to speak for your entire gender. Uh, I mean, this is a conversation that Helen and I got into <laughs> all the time while making this film, and, and it would get heated in the best way. And it was something I loved about, I love, the, I love Molly Ephraim as Irene Kelly as one of my favorite characters, because I think that that's something that you don't see a lot, and when you're talking about these various things or, or things that happen, are, are all of the women who have to do all, of, do all of this work that's sort of not expected of men often, you know, so. Right, we'll take some questions from here as well. Yes, go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Andrea Case, CTV News. Uh, question, has Gary Hart seen the film? Number one. Number two, will you show it to him? Number three, Hugh Jackman, did you talk to him at all in terms of researching this role? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I brought the film to Denver about a week ago and showed it to Gary and Lee Hart. Uh, we all went for hot chocolate after. <laughs> and, uh, and it's interesting to show them the movie because at first, I was presuming that the reaction would be how complicated it is for him to watch and, and talk about the emotional journey. And their first response was, Hugh is so good. He's such a good actor. <laughs> and, and Gary at one point said, do I really talk like that? And Lee said, yes, that's exactly how you talk. <laughs> uh, I spent some time uh, with Gary and his family before filming. Uh, obviously, out of respect, I've never played someone who is alive. I played real people who. Have Wolverine is real. I'm oh, sorry. Apart from Wolverine, <laughs> it's a secret. I told you backstage, George. Uh, and out, of course, out of respect for him, but also in terms of the process, what was most important to me was every single person. I spoke to many people before I met Gary, and almost every one of them. The only thing in common was this word enigma. Uh, and how fast and how smart how one of, he's one of the best politicians of the past 50 years many things But I wanted to sit there and be with him to understand what it is like to be around that sort of mysterious enigmatic quality uh, And I saw that there was so many parts of me. He's as sharp uh, I imagine as he's ever been you probably could speak to that Matt uh, Very interested very knowledgeable on any subject to what's going on today, and I have actual great respect for him, and we have, uh, I would say, an affection and friendship now. The Gary Hart that is portrayed in this film is not the Gary Hart that any of us saw in the newsreel clips of back in the day. You saw the smile, you saw the hiding Gary Hart. I think a lot of people will gain an insight into him. If you think, had Gary Hart won that and won the election, maybe there's no two George Bush presidencies, maybe there's no Clinton, it's a whole different Democratic Party, you know? And having been so close to it, the impact that one man's fall um, had is pretty enormous. Uh, yeah, I, again, I'm an Australian, so I'm seeing this from an outsider's point of view. I haven't voted in any election here. Uh, but spending time with Gary, and I'm not gonna tell you exactly what it was, but at one point he shared with me his 100-day plan if he had made it into office. And I can categorically tell you it would be probably a very different world today if that had happened. Got a question over here? Yes, in the back there. Yes, sir. 
Hi, Roger Munther from the Toronto Star. It's a question for the writers and Jason. I mean, obviously, the, this is a film, so they're, it's based on a true story and a book. There's obviously some, some creative license, but is there anywhere that you wouldn't go or you wouldn't want to sort of fictionalize from this story? Was there a limit to that? Look, it's a great question, particularly on this film, because the film is always asking, what should we know? What do we need to know? What do we want to know? Uh, and I've, for screenwriters, that becomes a very tricky question uh, because we want to leave that in your hands. We want this movie to be one that, as an audience, you're going to have one person's going to have a completely different experience from the next person. You ask one person uh, about this, and they'll say, "Well, I don't think we need to know what's going on in a president's bedroom." And the next person might say, "Well, actually, they want to be the, the president." Everything should be uh, available. These should have no secrets. We need to know everything. And, and neither person is right. And we want this to be a film where people can have that conversation after. So uh, it is a movie. You de do need to create dialogue for characters. And you do need to take them through uh, an emotional arc. Uh, but the facts are the facts in the film. Uh, what was important is that we give people different points of view. That even within the Washington Post, you have five different characters, young, old, male, female, veterans, newcomers, uh, each debating, how do, we how do we pursue this story? This is obviously something that people are interested. Obviously, people want to know. The Miami Herald has done this groundwork. Where do we go with this? And I'm hoping the people in the audience feel like they are right in that room trying to make that decision with them, trying to figure out what is relevant? What do I actually need to know? Yes, sir. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Isaac Richter from Tiempo Libre. Este, uh, you mentioned that uh, you were developing this, uh, this uh, film, the script, before the 2016 election and everything that happened, but did that event shape anything about how the film turned out, or did it, or did it inspire you to, to, as to, to, as to talk, talk about any, any certain topic, certain scene that might have come about? It certainly made the, film, the story feel more relevant to us. Uh, I don't think it had changed it, though. We had already written the script, yeah. and our interests remained the same. I mean, we, you know, Matt approached the book. I mean, Matt can say how he approached the book. But in my view, when he, when he talked about it to me, and we had had a lot of conversations. Our relationship goes back to 1999. He was covering Bill Bradley's presidential campaign. I was on the other side as an operative. We watched the process get more and more broken throughout our situ throughout our relationship. We kept a good relationship, but we watched the process get more and more messed up, more and more broken. And so, as Matt talked about the book, and I said that's a fucking movie, it's because I just I thought that it you know it'd be great to tell that story in in with more with more mass appeal than a book <coughs> might get. Um, that was we in in a weird way. 2016 didn't surprise either of us, and, and you know didn't surprise a lot of us on this stage. But we were telling a story of a system that we felt was broken from the inside for for a long time. Um, 16 was just you know more broken, maybe more quickly than we thought it would be. And it, and it raises I guess, a, a question that we're all interested in, and that is. Uh, whoever we're going to elect is going to be a human being, and a human being is going to have flaws. And we need to ask ourselves at all times, what kind of flaws do we want in that person? Yeah. <laughs> if it's broken, is it fixable? <laughs> yes. It's yeah. A, yeah. Yeah. George, it's a depressing question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for hope up here, please. <laughs> uh, yes, right here. Yes, sir. Hi, and Neil Smith, BBC News. Uh, Hugh, um, does making a film like this make you consider how you might uh, fare in the political sphere, especially as, <laughs> as, you know, who knows, there's maybe quite a few vacancies in your home country, uh, yeah, given, yeah, the, given the rapid turnover. Uh, I endorse him immediately. <laughs> I do too. I'm down. 100%. I will, make signs. I will work for you. <laughs> Someone start the pins. Yeah, just just don't, don't rule it out, Hugh. Whatever you do, don't. No, no categorical statements here. Uh, yes. The, no, the opposite. That's a good question. Literally, there was no particular aspiration to run for politics after looking into the world. It makes me want to run even further. I think it's a very, very... And, and one thing I love about the film is this, this cauldron of a campaign 
as the movie sees it, not just from the candidate's point of view, but from the, from the volunteers, from the press, from the family, decisions, really important decisions are being made on the fly under immense pressure. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think, plus now, as Matt says so brilliantly in his book, post Watergate, every single journalist Every voter is assuming there's a flaw that needs to be found out. So I'm going to find out the flaw. Thank God as an actor we don't have that standard because there wouldn't be any actors left. Uh, but, and I don't know if I can handle it, to be honest. Too thin-skinned, I think. Although 10-year-old tweets are starting to come out for people and that's bringing them down. Which, but you know, New York has a history of uh, senators who come from other places and the great thing about an Australian is you haven't <laughs> voted on anything. You know, you have no record to attack. <laughs> think so about his appeal in Erie County. I with think there's the, something uh, to be yeah. done. I, I don't know about you guys. I believe everything's fixable because I'm an optimist. But oh, They're laughing at me, yeah. <laughs> See, that's the optimist actor and why I probably should never go into politics. But No, I'm with you, I'm Hugh, but I also I really would vote for you. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I love the line, uh, I was just thinking about it this morning, that my character has that he believes in the sanctity of the process. And I think one thing I love about the film is it sort of reminds us that, yes, it's broken. And by the way, I'm saying that as an Australian. I think we've just elected our sixth prime minister in the last seven years or something. So there's, however, it's definitely a process. The democratic process is something worth fighting for, I would say. Um, there's not a country on the planet, a democratic country, where you, when the people of that country wouldn't want to change something of that process. But what I love about the movie is I think people are arguing about which parts of the process do we keep, which parts are worth fighting for, what is important, what is not. I think that's kind of where we're at now. Does, I mean, I know there's lots of people who like the system in the United States right now, and a lot of people who don't. But what, I, what struck me as very different from this film is the reporters are the same now as they were then. They asked the questions. The difference is the audience then, the, the voter, really cared about the private life, and clearly now they don't really care. So there seems to be this enormous shift in what the voter is willing to accept. Because a lot of the stuff about the current president came out before the election, and they still went to the polls and made the decision. So maybe there has been a real shift and that if it settles a little bit, we'll have a more stable kind of reality. So maybe the change is afoot. Well, you know, I, I don't think it's, I, I think it's narrow. Uh, yes, uh, the public cares less, but I also think it's, um, you know, it's, it's, the story's bigger than do we care about people's sex lives or not about their sex lives. In a sense, uh, you know, the question is, um, can, you know, what things matter in a candidacy? Can we focus on things that matter? Um, do we assume that uh, everyone is, is, do we as journalists, myself, having covered you know, five presidential campaigns, do we assume that everybody's lying, everybody's fraudulent, and it's our job to find out how? Uh, or do we endeavor to sort of provide the context that character requires? What have they been for their whole lives, their whole careers? How have they voted? Have they been corrupt? Have they been honest with constituents uh, in addition to being honest with their wife, right? I mean, what is the, what is the measure of someone's integrity in, in that context? I think those are questions we still wrestle with, particularly in a news cycle that goes so fast. And I think the point, uh, you know, the, the movie's a great movie because it's, this is an amazing cinematic story that people don't remember, and he was so fantastic. In my view, in that role of that, you know, it's compelling in and of itself. But it's also an opportunity, I think, for all of us, we hope, to sort of leave asking each other and arguing about, uh, you know, what it is, what it is that matters. And uh, are we getting, how, how do you get, how do you draw context from a political discussion that, you know, has oftentimes a, an hour or a 10 minute life cycle? We, and we did actually write this movie from a, a, a deeply hopeful, idealistic place. Like I, I say that I left politics cynical. I left it cynical about the process, but hopeful about its ability to change. And part of what we bring, what we brought to the script, and then what Jason and, and Hugh and the rest of the cast brought to the movie is, this is a deeply human movie. We show people, not the, the people that are involved in politics are human beings trying to make difficult decisions every single day, and we tried to show that. There are no black hats or white hats in our story, it, there's a lot of gray because people, a, a guy on, you know, in one scene makes the right decision, right decision, and the next scene makes the wrong decision. That's just life. Um, oh, the judgment. Yeah. You didn't assign a lot of value at all to that. Okay. Other questions here? Well, there you go. Go ahead, Neil. 
Hi, Hugh. Um, just to brighten things out a bit, this is going to be one of the first things people have seen you in since The Greatest Showman, which is still riding high in the charts of my country and many others. Have you um, come to grips with that? how much of a phenomenon that that's, that uh, film and the soundtrack has been and what a huge, enormous success it's been internationally? Uh, come to grips with it, with it is one term. According to my family, I'm very annoying how I keep bringing it up. <laughs> uh, my 13-year-old daughter, when I say, oh, by the way, we're still number one, <laughs> nobody cares, Dad. Like, <laughs> is often the refrain I hear at home. Um, if you come later tonight, uh, Matt Bai does an amazing version of A Million Dreams. I don't know if you'd yeah. be willing to do it now, but yeah, it's it's been an incredible. Honestly, I would, but it gets me so emotional here. <laughs> I just can't, I can't go on. Uh, but thank you, mate. It is it has been truly incredible, and if, honestly, and this is not just a, a lazy segue, but to think of having Logan and that movie, but all the while working on a Jason Reitman film about an issue which I think is very relevant and a movie I'm extremely proud of. I certainly am at a point in my career that I pinch myself and I feel very, very blessed. It will give him a appeal upstate in New York that uh, a lot of New York City residents don't have when they run for Senate. So. <laughs> <laughs> what did you learn about uh, pro politics throughout this process? Like when you finished the whole thing? Uh, a lot. Uh, I was, I think I mentioned I was 10 years old uh, when this happened, I didn't know this story. Um, and I'm not a student of history. Um, I'm someone madly in love with movies. And I've always wanted to make a film uh, as I'm interested in, in human beings. Uh, and in Gary Hart and the people around him, I saw a lot of complex characters that I wanted to portray. Uh, this is a unique screenplay, you know? It was co-written by a political journalist uh, who covered many presidential campaigns, the former press secretary for Howard Dean, Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, and, uh, you know, the son of the guy who directed Ghostbusters. So <laughs> I think we all brought a lot to the table is yeah, what I'm I trying to so, say. Yeah. I mean, we are in Reitman Square, so. Um, uh, behave. Yeah. What did you do, Helen? Oh, no, I didn't. I, I mean, this maybe this makes me sound dumb. I didn't realize that the way candidates were chosen before, what is it, 1972? 1972 like, right. I, I didn't know that this was, a part of this was because of a shift of how we chose the candidates that were running, which felt to me like such a big deal and such an obvious change that it was embarrassing to me that I got to the age that I am not even knowing that about the way America worked. This comes out on the day of the midterms, right? Should it have come out the day before? <laughs> <laughs> so people could see it before they go to the polls? Uh, my advice is, first thing, vote. Yeah. Second thing, go see our movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you watching the midterms with a completely like, out of this world focus this time? I mean, I, uh, I, 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 left, I left that business sort of with my hair on fire. Um, <laughs> And I do follow it. I mean, I follow it probably much more than your average per That's actually not true. Your average person <laughs> follows it way more than I follow it now. I'm very often running into people like at the beach who are like, can you believe the, can you believe the spread and the fave unfave in California 32? And I'm like, I, no, I, I'm not following. Like, and so um, I, I, I do follow it, but um, you know, I'm not deep inside the, the, you know, the Nunez race or the D latest DCCC polls. Right. Um, you know, I care, I vote, uh, but I'm not like a, 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 an insider about this anymore, thankfully. Thanks for everybody's time today. Thanks, George. Really appreciate Thank it. You, Thank you, George. Thank you, sir.